Hold on, welcome back. Hour three, and one more hour to go, and then you can officially start your. Go ahead, start drinking, unless you're driving, unless you're a Kennedy then you, or a, a Hunter Biden, then you get away with it. But otherwise, mere mortals cannot, and I don't recommend it. And just back to the James Patterson thing, the guy is literally a book a month. There's no way he's writing these books. I wonder if he even reads them. Just put his name on it, and it sells. I mean, what the hell? He's a millionaire, and I'm here filling in on the day before the 4th of July. So who is the sucker, I ask you? Speaking of suckers and somebody who is not, I mean, it's a rare occasion that I ever do guests, but when I do, they have to be something special or have blackmail material on me, and this guest is someone who fits both of those categories. His name is Dean Carianis. He was uh, Coco Jr. on the Rush Limbaugh show for... I don't know, TV show, the radio show, probably close to 30 years. He's now a columnist for the New York Sun. He's also host of the History Author podcast. He actually interviews authors about history books. He loves history. He knows more about history than most people. He's probably forgotten more about history than I could ever hope to know. Dean Carianis. How are you, Dean? Hey, Eric. How are you? I'm doing well. Live up to I... that now, all right? Live up to that intro. <laughs> Good job. Well, I'm just a little ticked that you gave the okay to start drinking beer after I'm on the air. And as a highly trained professional, I cannot be imbibing while I'm on with you. So right. I already well, well to I noticed how you, you said beer, how I gave permission to, you were mad. I gave permission <laughs> to drink beer because everybody knows you start with liquor. So let's not pretend well, noon hasn't happened in New Jersey. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about the revolution, so the Whiskey Rebellion. There you go. There you go. It is is all in service. That's right. It's it's research, officer. (laughs) Officer, it's totally research. Hand me something to mop up my vomit. Uh, Dean, you, uh, you are a student of history. You are a fan of history. You, uh, you follow this stuff, and tomorrow is the 247th anniversary of uh, top five for sure dates in all of human history and so far you know like birth of christ i'm talking about the uh, you name it what where would you rank july 4th 1776 in the annals of the importance of history wow well it's not a satisfying answer but this is how you tell that I'm not just one of those people that uses a made-up title like student of history. Not that I mind that, but mm. it's it's one of those things like how they'll stick somebody on and say they're an activist or they're a strategist, and you know that they've never run. Oh yeah, no, 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 or a buff. They're a buff. That means that they were available. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so uh, I thought we were going to start off maybe with a nice July Fourth barbecue question, but having listened to the previous two hours, the the only thing close you came was roasting Gaddafi. <laughs> he's the only one you talked about. He said he's roasting or a spit in hell. And so uh, I guess we'll have to get right into the history stuff, huh? That's right. Let's get but, right into it. We'll end on a later note. We'll end but on it's roasting. interesting because you say the fourth and the uh, the column oh, that I wrote I in New York song, which, you, you saw it, right? Well, yeah, well this, this is important to, to history. This is this shows that you're not just somebody. I didn't make the holiday. You, and I, you know, John Adams, <laughs> they, 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 just because it took longer to copy the document, uh, whatever. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Keep going. Keep going. Well, th- this is this is how you know that people are are really into this because they still argue a bit over this. But he wrote this great letter to his wife Abigail, as he was wont to do, and he described pretty much exactly how we celebrate it today. But uh, so first to dodge your question, there's no there's no question that he felt that this day was very significant. And he felt the second because that's when there was the first vote. They finally got the two recalcitrant recalcitrant traits, um, the two states that didn't vote yes. See, you told me I could have liquor and now I can't say recalcitrant. (laughs) But uh, they got Philadelphia and South Carolina, which had both objected to declaring independence on board. And they had the vote in the Continental Congress. New York State abstained, which I always find kind of fascinating because they they're always tend to be kind of full of themselves. <laughs> and so the second he, he writes his wife and he says how, how wonderful this day is, the second day of July 1776, and he goes on to describe how it will be the most memorable epoch in American history. So I, who am I to disagree with John Adams? I, I guess it's it has to be way, way up there, as you said, the, the birth of Christ and then 
sort of like Krusty the Clown on The Simpsons, and then the man walked on the moon. Then for a long time, nothing Bobby happened. Bobby Thompson in the shot heard <laughs> around the world. You know, Bobby Orr's goal in overtime to win the Stanley Cup. All of those things <laughs> rank right up there with the... And so uh, one of the popular things, Dean Carrion, is that uh, people like to d- circulate on the 4th of July is a list of the signatories who pledge their lives, their, uh, their, their property, and their sacred honor to this cause. And then there's the list of particulars of uh, this one was tortured, this one was cut in half, this one lost everything. And uh, it's, it's popular to read. It's only partially true. What yeah. re- what really was the fate of the the gentleman who signed the Declaration of Independence? Well, I think the important thing that it all boils down to is just how many myths we have always around the founders or or anybody in history, really. Um, and for the Declaration of Independence, I think the important thing is not the not to people argue, for instance, that, oh, well, their houses were burned down, sure, from that list, but lots of people had their houses burned down. Some of them were burned down by patriots. And this kind of thing, to, to undermine the entire contribution is the goal. And we all get little things wrong about history, and the Declaration of Independence and the Revolutionary War is one of those. And I, I interviewed two great historians about their book, Valley Forge, and they talked about this legend of Washington kneeling in the snow at Valley Forge and calling on God and, and praying for deliverance. And one of the one of the authors said to me, well, it, it didn't happen, but it, it should have happened. And it's still a, a great story. And it's still <laughs> it still embodies so much of it. And I was surprised to hear uh, Bob Drury and Tom Clavin and the authors of that book. I was I was just surprised to hear that because usually we just care about the facts and just care about primary sources. And can somebody document for me Washington kneeling? And there's there's a statue of him kneeling in prayer at a, at a cemetery near where I grew up in Paramus, New Jersey, for instance. It's this just iconic moment. And it's important because it speaks to the larger picture and how they did feel about, for instance, the 4th of July, which John Adams thought that it should be called the Day of Deliverance by Solemn Acts of Devotion to God Almighty. He was never accused of being a succinct guy. Never fit on but, a T-shirt. Would never have yeah. been horrible on a T-shirt. <laughs> or a beer koozie. But yeah. as, but this was the thing about what you're saying with, with the Declaration. And to me, as, knowing you were going to ask me this question, I said the, the key thing to me is that those 56 men, not only were they very young, you know, think about it, three of them in their 20s. What the heck were you doing in your 20s, Derek? Don't answer that because I know, and I that's why I'm on the show. <laughs> the statute I, of I limitations has not yet run on most of it, <laughs> so I shall not answer that question. People used to joke about me bringing that Polaroid with me to <laughs> bars, but see, you never know who you might need to blackmail in the future. But they, they had families. They were men of real wealth, and a revolution is not something you usually see coming from the ruling class, from the comfortable people, from the people mm-hmm. who own states. Why, why would they uh, – estates? Why would they care to risk it? Why would they overturn the apple cart? And that's what each and every one of them did, and so I think that's the – wider story there and when i read some of these things i know the sort of sniveling little people at snopes which used to be really great and now it's it's really gone downhill and a lot of those places some people are very well meaning usa today did a breakdown of it but to me these guys had economic security that few people on earth had in the 18th century they risked it all as you said they they write that line and say our lives our fortunes our sacred honor now, they had nothing to gain from this. They didn't know that they were going to survive it even. A bunch of them died during the revolution. In, in so far they, as they do... freedom and individual liberty, you're right. These wealthy guys had it much more than most people in this in this in the colonies. Yeah, they didn't have to do this. Benjamin Franklin already by then is, is a legend, right? He says that famous line, indeed we must all hang together, otherwise we must assuredly hang separately. And that was also, there's a, everybody pretty much knows that line, but there's a great sub-story there that, that you will enjoy, and I hope all your listeners will enjoy. And that's, he turned to Elbridge Gerry, or Gary, as we have the term gerrymandering, another one of those little inside things, of Massachusetts, and he's a little willowy guy, right? And Benjamin Harrison of Virginia is a fat guy. And he turns to him and he says, well, with me at least being the hanging We'll be over in a minute, but you, you'll be dancing in the air for an hour after I'm gone. So I, I love that they, they had literal gallows humor when they're there signing the declaration. So they knew this was serious. They knew that 
they were risking having their homes ransacked and burned as they were, that guys like Abraham Clark of New Jersey would have his two sons captured and thrown into those infamous prison hulks off of New York and New Jersey. That one was called the Jersey. They knew that their sons might be killed. One of the signers, John Witherspoon, his eldest son, James, is killed at the Battle of Germantown. Uh, even, even George Washington's adopted son ends up dying of, of disease at Yorktown. So they knew that this was risky. They could have just stayed home drinking wine and hanging out and letting other people suffer and not cared. But they really took this seriously. And I think that, yes, people should go and look at the specifics of their fates, but the broader story shouldn't be lost and dismissed as well. If we can find one thing wrong, it means none of them really suffered right. or none of them really risked anything. Of or, they- you know, judging by today's mores, uh, they were slave owners, half of them, so who cares? We're talking with Dean Carianis, host, host of the History Author Podcast, which you should you can get where all fine podcasts are sold. Um, here's, I, you have, uh, Dean, you have a weird affinity for random presidents you have uh, an absolute love of history, but I want to I want to put you on the spot now, and I, I you could surprise me with this answer. I'm I'm fully prepared for that, but I'm going to go ahead and just say that you're a little conventional on this one, and give you uh, the choice, which you're free to ignore and go third party. But the indispensable man of the American founding is it George Washington or Benjamin Franklin or somebody else? Well, I mean, George Washington is already called the indispensable man, so I guess that's pretty easy. Eh, but we're not going by <laughs> tattoos. We're, going, we're not going but, by uh, trademarks. But, you know, Benjamin Franklin is the only signatory of really pretty much all the founding documents of this country. He had his fingers in treaties yeah. and the Declaration and the Constitution. I would, I'm just curious, your take. Don't give me what the conventional wisdom is. Don't right. give me what the books say. Don't give me where the, the, the nicknames Never. are. I would never insult you with the conventional wisdom, but I'm going to give you a similar unsatisfying answer to the first one, and that's that you can. I, I always avoid picking who's your favorite president, who's your favorite. It's not like a sports team to me, or maybe it is, because they all had to work together. They all played their role. For instance, uh, consider Dr. Joseph Warren. He dies at the Battle of Bunker Hill. He's a huge founding father. That, that was a, another author that I interviewed, author of the book Founding Martyr, Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren by Christian Despina. And here you go. Here's a guy. He dies. He never knows what his sacrifice will be. His family, his children are all cast to the wind for a long time. They, they said, well, they're just lost to history. And then one day one of them showed up where there was a painting and says, no, we're out there. It's just no one knows about us. And that was a great, great part of that book and that interview. It shows you should always ask and don't accept that conventional wisdom. But you had a lot of people. You know, there's a plaque where I went to school at, at Rutgers, New Jersey, where Alexander Hamilton goes and he, a self-trained bookish guy, right? What the heck business did he have in artillery? None at all. He had no training in that, didn't know. And, and think about it even today. If you need to learn to run an artillery piece and you said, hey, I'm going to go on the Internet, how, how much could you really learn, right? <laughs> and yet this, that's exactly what he does. And he not only does it, not only does it incredibly well, not only catches the eye of the great George Washington, but he ends up saving the army, giving Washington's men time to withdraw on December 1st, 1776, right there in New Brunswick, New Jersey, uh, on the campus of the old Queens there at, at Rutgers. And they, he mans, that, mans it across the Raton River. He stops General Cornwallis' advance, or at least slows it down enough that Washington can take his army, decamp, fold everything up, and remember how precious supplies were to them. And they continue their retreat through Princeton to Trenton. Unfortunately, they end up in Pennsylvania, but that's where they were going. But, you know, nobody can nobody can fault them for that ending up outside Philadelphia. <laughs> but they, they end up all the way there. And that's just because of his contribution. And if Alexander Hamilton dies at that moment, there's no Broadway play. There's no turnout biography of the guy, maybe. And we just there's no dramatic duel later with Aaron Burr, the vice president. Also, it happens in New Jersey. Yeah, maybe and Aaron Burr so we don't know his president. name. Maybe Aaron Burr ends yeah, up being true. president early on, which would have dramatically changed the course of history. Dean Carianis, last comment from you, just on one of my, my favorite little factoids. It's well known, but it's still one of those things where you're like, wow, the, this, is, this is God having a sense of humor or a, a sense of history too. 
Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, two of the most famous founding fathers, die on the 50th anniversary of the uh, Independence Day holiday. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, that that was in my column, as I said, at, the, at New York Sun. And I, I do want to plug it because uh, my colleagues there are doing great work at nysun.com, not saying it for my own sake. But I said, that's the that's the ironic thing. And as you said, the, it, the hand of God is seen in this. You can see why the, why the founders believed that and why they were always looking skyward. And you think of John Adams, if he had gotten his way and we celebrated it on July 2nd, they wouldn't have really had the same right. ring in history that, <laughs> hey, it's two founding fathers. And a third founding father, by the way, also died on on July 4th. And I wonder if you know who that is. I was thinking, since you always put me on the spot. I do I not. ask you. I'll admit my ignorance okay. gle- gle- gleefully. Another hero of the Revolution that we might never have known. He shot at the Battle of Trenton and saved and goes on to serve as President of the United States, James Monroe. James, James Monroe, Monroe died on July 4th died. as well. Yeah, he dies in uh, 1831. So he dies, uh, one of them. And it's, it's nice, nice even numbers, right? The then we went five years past <laughs> 55 years. Well, yep, Dean so 50, Carion- 55, yeah. Dean Carianis, you go to nysun.com, read his columns there, July 2nd, the day that President Adams celebrated independence. All his work there, and subscribe. Do yourself a favor and subscribe to the History Author Podcast. Thanks for enlightening us, as you always do, Dean. Have a great Independence Day.